I'm delighted to say that Gareth Roberts uh, for the second Friday running of the Anfield Wrap joins us on the line. Morning to you, Gareth. Good morning, lads. Okay. That's it. So crisis over, right? <laughs> well, it feels a little bit like that. I mean, it's much, much better waking up in the morning knowing that Liverpool have won, uh, knowing that we've sort of laid such a big glove on on a rival, which Spurs are. Um, and yeah, it feels much better than last week, definitely. Yeah, we've just been having a debate a little bit earlier on in terms of um, I'm being slightly facetious in asking you that question because I'm not 100% convinced, Gareth, that maybe they are back. I think when you look at some of the opportunities that came that w came their way, the goals was obviously all coming from mistakes. They're putting themselves in the position to get the goals. But um, a slight sense that the performance of Trent Alexander-Ireland notwithstanding, notwithstanding, that maybe it's papered over the cracks a little bit and there's still some uh, fairly deep-rooted issues there. I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I'd go the other way and say that in a lot of Liverpool's games that they, they haven't won, you've seen promise there, you've seen good things there, and it hasn't felt like we're a million miles away from winning those games. Um, and, you know, we've been a little bit unlucky. We, we haven't been great in front of goal, as you've referenced. And then there's obviously the issue at the back, uh, which, which got even worse last night, knowing that, you know, Fabinho wasn't lining up before the first whistle and then knowing that Matter wouldn't be lining up after the half-time whistle. So I think to be coming through that adversity, to still be in the mix, which you've got to say Liverpool are, we're four points off the top of the league um, and everyone was writing us off not so long ago. This is a big win. We stayed in it. There's a chink of life for Liverpool. Um, you know, only the other week, man, everyone was talking up Man United. Now they've been be beaten by Sheffield United, and the picture looks slightly different there. Obviously, Manchester City's the one everyone's worried about. They've got the game in hand. But for me, Liverpool had to win last night. It was almost cup final type stuff in terms of staying in there and staying in there with a chance of doing something title wise this season. I'm not saying they will, I'm saying they've got a chance now, though. And the chance would have gone if we hadn't have won last night. And you say, you know, that it was papered over the cracks. Well, there's only one side creating big chances last night, and that was Liverpool. Um, Tottenham Hotspur only had one shot in the second half. It was a worldie that went in the back of the net that he'll probably never hit like that again in his life. Uh, mm. It was Liverpool creating the chances, and Trent Alexander, you, who you mentioned, his performance was massive because his form all season hasn't quite been there. He hasn't been the Trent that we know and love. But last night it was there, you know, from the first whistle almost, he's setting up Sadio Mane. And all game, defensively and offensively, he was much, much better. And he's been key to Liverpool over the last couple of years. He's been our playmaker almost. So to have him back looking more like himself, I think, was massive. And, and a shout for James Milner as well. thought having him mm. on the pitch made a big difference to Liverpool. What, um, like you talk about the Liverpool chances, like the chances that Tottenham did create, and obviously they had the ball in the back of the net after three minutes, which could have given the game a very different uh, very different look and a, yeah. an opportunity shortly after that as well. But whatever chances Tottenham did create and whatever chances teams do tend to create against Liverpool are coming by and large from that ball over the top and they look very susceptible to it. I suppose maybe a two-fold question about your thoughts with the current roster of players that they have and their maybe incapacity to deal with that possibly being related to the experience of the players that are there and off the back of that, how vital it is now that they, in the, over the next three days, go and get somebody. Or not, in your own opinion, yeah? Yeah, it's absolutely vital that they go and get someone. I, I don't believe that there isn't somebody in world football who's available, who wants to play for the champions, who is a better defender than Nat Phillips or a better defender than Reese Williams. That's not to throw either of those lads under the bus. They've, they perform manfully, but they're, they're not to the level of a team that is trying to finish in the top two, for instance. And, and you know, there must, there must be someone out there. Liverpool will have been offered players during this transfer window. Liverpool will, will have been quoted fees for players during this transfer window. And I think they've just got to bite the bullet over the next couple of days and get someone in. It feels all a little bit sort of eight, nine years ago when John Henry was writing an open letter to fans about why they hadn't done something in the transfer window. And he talked then about Liverpool's status. Well, Liverpool's status from eight years ago to now has changed. Liverpool are the champions. Liverpool have won the European Cup and the World Club Cup. They need to act like that. And I, I understand that there's a pandemic. I understand that, you know, money's tight, revenue's not what it was and all the rest of it. But equally, I don't believe that going and getting one centre-back, even two, uh, would bankrupt the club in the current situation. There's got to be someone out there. So I'd like to see someone to come in because it's an unprecedented situation in terms of the uh, of the injuries at the back. And, and we are, you, you, you used the phrase paper in the cracks before. Well, we are paper in the cracks at the back. I don't want to see Henderson and Fabinho 
playing centre half for Liverpool. I want to see them in the middle because that's where they can perform. Fabinho is one of the best in, his, in the world in his position, which is in midfield, not defence. And he's done he, he's done well in defence, but equally he can be a little bit rash on the edge of the box. We saw that last week. So I want him back where he where he pulls the strings for Liverpool, where he can let Thiago go further forward. I don't want to see these makeshift solutions. So. I, Liverpool have got to do business for me if they've got any ambition this season. How deep is the frustration within the Liverpool fan groups at the moment regarding that inaction in terms of signing a central defender over the last few months? Yeah, it, it's growing and it's growing. And look, you know, there's, there's some extreme and, and some not so, as, it, as, as is always the case. You know, I don't think we should judge, you know, whole fan bases by one or two fans or anything like that. But, you know, because I've seen other opposition fans talking about, oh, they want the board out and they want an ownership change. Well, collectively, I don't think we do. Everyone can see what FSG have done for Liverpool. They've won us the league, which we wanted for three decades. So they've got to take some credit for that. They got Jurgen Klopp, you know, some credit for that too. Um, but equally, they can be conservative at, at times, and they talk about risk a lot, and they talk about you know not not making short term solutions. But this situation cries out for a short term solution. That is exactly what the problem is. So could they do something on loan, maybe? I mean, I would have liked to have seen something at the other end of the transfer window as soon as it was open, because, you know, that would have said to me there was a plan in place, but it looked like they took a gamble. They, they, you know, they went with the idea of Fabinho being a, almost a permanent centre-half, and then the situation has got gradually worse. So admit your mistake and put it right now and go and get someone. And it might be someone that, you know, it, it could be a name, it could be a player where we all groan a little bit and say, oh, I'm not him. But equally, throwing in a lad who's 19 years old who was playing for Kidderminster Harriers last season doesn't make sense either. Or, or Nat Phillips, who was wanted by a string of championship clubs, and I know Swansea were after him. You know, that, that to me, no disrespect to the lad, is his level, not playing at the top end of the Premier League. So they are not solutions now, that, you know, and, and there is a problem. So go and, go and rectify the situation. I think that's what most fans are now asking of the owners. When you mentioned the extreme reactions there, are, are we talking uh, sections of Liverpool supporters who are saying FSG have done their part now and it's time to move on? Is, is that how extreme we're talking? There's always bits of that, isn't there? Especially when you you, you know if you use uh, social media as a, a barometer of feeling, then you you know you can find FSG out on there. There's people who've never liked them all the way through. There's people who think they're the best thing since sliced bread, and there's people in between. Um, you know, you will be able to find some fans who are saying that about FSG, no doubt about it. Um, but what I would regard as more sensible fans, if you like, and not calling for massive change like that right now. We are, you know, we've got we've got to not look too entitled about this situation. You know, we're current, currently fourth in the Premier League and reigning champions of the Premier League. You know, there have been worse times than this to be a Liverpool fan. So I'm certainly not calling for that. I'm just hoping that a bit of sense prevails in that they go out and they rectify a big, big hole in Liverpool's squad right now. What should be the medium-term ambition then, Gareth? If, if the short-term ambition is so clearly to go and sort out the centre centre back position over the next couple of weeks, if possible, next couple of days, really. But in the medium term, where should they be looking at in the summertime if this is a season where they don't manage to bring the Premier League back to Anfield, or if they don't manage to bring the Champions League back to Anfield? I mean, it, it's just going again and staying there and being in the position to challenge. I think that's the thing because in the past. Liverpool, when they did, were able to mount a title challenge, which obviously wasn't often enough in those 30 years, it was always boom, then bust. It was always challenge and then fall away. For me, if they're constantly in the top three, the top two, thereabouts, getting to the later stages of the Champions League, then that's where you should be and that's what your ambition should be. Of course, you always try to win those things, but I think there's an element of... You know, it can depend on who you draw. It can depend on how well your opponents are doing. You know, there's only so much you can control. Like Man City, we know will always have a big bud a bigger budget than Liverpool can go out and do greater things in the transfer market. We just got to cop for that and accept that. But equally, we've got to be there or thereabouts every season, ready to pounce. I think what one of my worst seasons as a as a Liverpool fan in, in more recent times is when Leicester City won the league. Because I was looking at the table that year thinking, well, where are Liverpool? And why were we not ready to pounce on a season when lots of teams were not very good? And Leicester were in the situation to win it and fair play to them and they deserved it that season, not to do them down. But that's when Liverpool should have been ready to pounce. So that's where I want to see them. And I just think as well, you know, talking about risks, talking about revenue, 
you know, Liverpool could easily win the league for me this season. They could easily finish fifth. And if they finish fifth, well, how risky is that in terms of revenue, in terms of retention, in terms of recruitment, in terms of your status? So that, to me, is surely a bigger risk than going out and buying a centre-half or two right now. Uh, so that would be what I would be saying to the owners if they ever listen to me, which I'm sure they don't. <laughs> yeah, even on that, like Trent Alexander Ireland say, saying after the game last night that nothing had actually changed that much. That uh, I wasn't sure whether to take uh, whether that was to be taken in the positive sense or not. But anyway, look, we'll see. You, you mentioned the fixture list that's upcoming, so there's be plenty of a uh, chance to chat about that over the coming weeks. We wanted to mention to you as well and talk to you a little bit about when we had John last week, Gareth, and you took a lot of abuse for saying that the absence of fans was negatively impacting in Liverpool's performance. Um, and the response from, I'd say, a somewhat sizable, seeing the traffic that was coming through, a uh, sizable cohort of United fans was swift. It was abusive on a very personal level and to the people of Liverpool, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely brutal. Were you surprised by it? I was surprised by, you know, why the comment caused such a, a, a stir, really. I mean, you know, I've seen Gary Neville say something very similar in the last couple of days and he doesn't seem to have been on the end of it. It does seem to me that there is, a, you know, there is a core, not a core, there is a section of supporters on both sides, Liverpool and Manchester United, who take that rivalry too far. Um, you know, for me, th there's plenty you can talk about and plenty of stick you can throw each other's way in a sporting sense. Without, without having to go down the road of talking about digs around homelessness, digs around football disasters, and I include Munich in that because I know it goes back the other way from Liverpool fans to Man United fans. You know, Mu for me, Munich, Heysel, Hillsborough, all of those things are off the table. The football isn't a place where we should be talking about death and tragedies. And I think it's worth remembering that there are people who are still affected by all of those tragedies on a daily basis, families, etc., friends, etc., and would you go up to a, fr a family or a friend of any of those families uh, who've been affected in the street and say something like you would say to them online, some of the stuff that was sent my way? No, you wouldn't. So why why say it online? Um, and like I say, there, there are extremes on both sides. It, it's a, it, it's seen as a little bit, you know, bravado, manly. I don't, I, I don't know what it is to say, you know, oh, I hate Scousers or oh, I hate Manx. And look, you know, in a sporting sense, I don't like Man United. I want, I want Liverpool to do better than them every single season. And that will remain the case until I pass away. But the rest of it is too far. And I think some people need to be respectful of where the line is there. And yet, you know, I, I come on a show and talk about Liverpool and talk about Man United and talk about the league table and the influence of fans. And I don't really expect to be having a conversation about Heysel five minutes after or Hillsborough five minutes after. Um, so, yeah, I, I think some people need to look in the mirror there, really. Um, and as I say, it's including Liverpool fans. I'm not just throwing this at Man United fans. I know that there is a section of Liverpool fans that go too far on it. There's a rivalry and then there's just taking things far too far. And, and that's what happened, I think, with the, with the reaction to that. There was a bit of a pile on. Can we talk to you a little bit about that aspect of it? Because I think that like there was a pile on and it was a social media storm last week, but it is a narrative that exists far away from that as well, as you've written brilliantly about on, on the Anfield rap over the years. Um, like when we talk about that sizable cohort, in your experience, like very much been amongst, been of the fans, Gareth, and amongst the fans. And what's your sense of how much of a vocal minority it is? And also the point about um, that you make there about like these are people who live cheek by jowl in the general run of things without having to engage in that level of abuse like your sense of um why it why it goes over the top uh, when it comes to football yeah i mean th there is obviously a, as is detailed every single time we play them a, a big rivalry between the two cities we do want to do out outdo each other um and that is in terms of everything not just football it's music it's fashion it's everything else, but you know, I'm I'm one who's sort of crossed the divide, if you like, in that I I worked for a decade in Manchester, so I've got a lot of a lot of friends in Manchester, friends who are Mancunians. I know the city well, and I find you know I find it all so reductive because there have been times on both sides where one city has helped out the other, and and, and there are little bits and bobs that people don't seem to talk about enough. And I'm not talking about Matt Busby being a former Liverpool player here, and I'm not talking about Bill Shankly you know, helping out Man United in situations or anything like that, going back absolutely years. I'm going back, you know, more recent times. So, you know, people, it, it, what I think is, is, is wrong is where the focus is sometimes. So, you know, even now we're talking about this. Well, how many people have done this in the grand scheme of things in terms of the millions that support, you know, Manchester United and Liverpool? It, 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 it's, it's a small number, but we talk about the small number because it's extreme behaviour. I know for a fact that, 
you know, when Manchester United have come to Liverpool at times, th there have been wreaths laid, laid on the Hillsborough Disaster Memorial and things like that. But that doesn't get talked about because that doesn't fit this particular narrative. Equally, you know, um, Kerry Dalglish always talks about uh, Alex Ferguson being one of the first people to ring him up after Hillsborough and things like that. You know, the, the two clubs have been respectful to each other on a level and then also disrespectful to each other on a level. And how much is it prevalent? Well, look, it is prevalent and it gets passed down from generation to generation. This has been the case throughout my life, you know, 40 odd years of, of watching footy, that there has been this rivalry there and there's been this edge there. And once upon a time, it was going far too far and, and people were throwing golf balls at each other with nails in them. I think we've come away from that now, thankfully. Uh, but now what we've got is the internet generation where, like I say, it just seems a go-to to just start, start dropping in phrases about Hillsborough Heysel. You know, bit, like th there's this thing, not just Manchester United, other, other sets of fans seem to do it. Oh, the Scousers, bin dippers. Like homelessness is not funny. Poverty is not funny. And how can you be dropping that phrase into conversation day by day or week by week and at the same time applauding what Marcus Rashford's doing for child poverty? I don't quite see how you can balance it in your own mind, but but then you just get this awful thing of it's just banter. Well, well, banter needs to do one then. Let, let's let jib banter from football because it's awful. If that's banter, I don't want any part of it because... You know, it, there's a huge homelessness problem in Manchester, as, as as anyone with any sense from the city would tell you, and a huge problem with child poverty. The same in Liverpool, with two northern cities, two cities that have suffered a lot of the same problems. And, and sport is our getaway for a lot, a lot of people growing up in those areas. And perhaps that's partly why it is. It, it's sort of, you know, you, you follow your team with such a passion that it spills over at times. But I still think we can talk about it and we can talk about having a bit more sense around it. And we can talk about where that line is a bit more because it doesn't get talked about enough that. And instead, it's easier to just go down the road of, well, they said this and they did this, so that justifies why I'm doing this now. Well, now just put an end to it. Just be normal, be human. Treat the pandemic as a moment to press the reset button and, and, and behave in a better way. Why do you think football is used as a, a conduit for hate or, or why is it such a, an effective conduit for hate that we see this in football stadiums quite often? We see this very often, as you've experienced on social media, when it comes to some sort of divisive argument that has nothing to do with the levels of hate that we're actually seeing. Why do we see so much of it in football? I think it's almost seen as otherworldly at times, isn't it? Where, where the rest of society's rules don't apply, you know, so... I can see that to an extent in that it is an escape. It's an escape for me as well, and, and it's one of the reasons why I really miss going to the ground and miss football without fans, because, yeah, it's great watching it on the television, but I'm not having a pint with my mates and I'm not enjoying all the routines around going to going to Liverpool week in, week out, uh, and everyone's missing that right now. But th there is a thing, I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's the rivalry stuff, there's the sort of the, the group behaviour stuff, there's the... I'm representing my city or my football club and that they're an opposite tribe and so therefore, you know, we, we, we can throw some stick their way and vice versa. I, I quite like some of that, but again, it's knowing where the line is. There's plenty of stick you can give, which is fairly gentle, which isn't going over the line, which isn't referencing people dying. And and, it, and it's fine, It's you know, it's ultimately good-natured. It can be stick, I don't know, what, whatever you want it to be, about, about clothes, about haircuts, about, you know, sport and ambition or lack of, whatever it may be. But there is a minority um, who, who follow football who let us down all the time and, and, and make it, you know, look, look a worse place than it actually is. I mean, you know, I still think some of the way that police treat football fans is awful. But the police will point to the behaviour of, of the minority and say, well, that's why we're doing it. So that's why, you know, this needs to tighten up. It needs challenging. It needs talking about more. But like I say, well, like I said before, I, I think the, the big takeaway for me to remember all the, all the way through all of this is that it's a minority. And that, you know, on both sides, there are brilliant supporters of both clubs who know where the line is. And like I say, I know I know plenty of Mancunians, I've had plenty of pints with Mancunians, I've been to the city a lot, and I know the I know plenty of Mancunians that come the other way as well. So this idea that there's some kind of, you know, false border up and we're lighting fires either side, it's not quite like that. I just think some people get carried away when the two teams meet. Have you seen Munich air disaster chance much in Anfield and have you ever seen it challenged by Liverpool's fans? 
I certainly like it certainly lessened all that kind of stuff now I think um obviously you know there's, there's disasters that Liverpool have suffered I think once upon a time I mean look I, I grew up in in Heighton in Liverpool and I can remember a huge daub of, of graffiti in, in Heighton that said Munich 58 on one of the one of the tougher estates shall we say in Heighton for all the time that I was growing up <clears throat> And, and that just was, that was just there. I, you know, you would see it scraped into desks at school and things like that. And, and you know, when you look back now as an adult, well, that, well that's awful. Well, you know, why, why were we referencing something like that? Why were we ever singing about stuff like that? But equally, you know, surely there are Man United fans who wonder why there are, there are songs about the sun or there are references to Heysel and Hillsborough in songs that they sing. And, you know, have I seen it recently on the cop? I can't say. Have I have seen it away at old, away when we've been to Old Trafford? Um, I've been on the divide between the two sets of fans and seeing it on both sides. I've seen, you know, people mimicking being crushed, obviously as a reference to Hillsborough, and I've seen people pretending to crack, you know, pretending to fly planes, whatever you want to call that Munich gesture, the other way. Both of which are hugely distasteful and unnecessary, and just not somewhere where you need to go and. You know, I, I understand that, you know, people uh, get pumped up, that the adrenaline takes them somewhere that they don't really want to be at times. And But I just think that should be off the table. And and there are people you can follow, certainly people I follow on social media who, whose family were at Hillsborough. And every time any of this happens, they're on there saying, well, this is a reminder, yes, again, this is a reminder I didn't need. You know, they, they still want the outlets of football. They still want to support, or a lot of them still want to support Liverpool, still want to have Liverpool as part of their lives. They don't want to be reminded about a disaster in 1989 every time Liverpool and Manchester United meet. Equally, mm. I'm sure there are families who lost people at, at Munich who would say the same. And then Heysel... You know, Heysel's the worst one, well, almost the worst one of the lot, because it's always, well, well, it was your fault. It was your fault. You never talk about it. Well, I, I had that leveled at me last week. You never, this is the disaster that Liverpool fans never talk about. Well, if anyone wants to use Google and the fingers and Anfield rap and Heysel, they will find that we talked about it at length. They will find about it that we did a series of articles on the 30th anniversary, a special podcast. We, we, un, we unearthed a load of documents uh, statements from from witnesses at the time and we wrote about it really honestly and we spoke to people in Italy and we spoke to people who were there and we also referenced the fact that people went to jail for it and what more do people want or is it just banter it's just banter that you want well it's not banter so yeah it, it, it it's it's not great is it, it it's awful it's, it's a bad side of football but again I would re-emphasize over and over again it's the minority and it's the minority that mm. needs to change and the rest of us can crack on with support and two great football clubs. Can I just ask you very briefly, Gareth, at the end, because you mentioned just there about it being off the table and it feels like the rivalry now is the two of them are potentially fighting over the, uh, or certainly in the title race at this stage, seems to have almost given more voice to it. And like the younger generations yeah. that are coming into it maybe might be worse than the, uh, you know, that learned aspect of it may be worse than the the origins of, of it almost. Where do you see it all going? Like it, it's not going anywhere anytime soon by the looks of it. Well, and this is where I, I just think anyone who has got a bit of influence, I mean, you know, it was mentioned there, do you, do, have you seen it challenged? I mean, I have seen it. I have seen the behaviour challenged amongst Liverpool fans. And, and that should continue. And that should happen among Man United fans, surely, as well. Because the, the way things work around match culture is that things get passed down. That's how, that's how songs happen. That's how songs remain. You know, I mean, Liverpool still sing the song where we're, we're, we're talking about hate and Nottingham Forest. We haven't played them for years and years and years. And there'll be young fans going to Anfield, going in normal times, going, well, why are you singing about Nottingham Forest? Then you explain why you're singing about Nottingham Forest and about the European Cup and about the fact that they were a rival for a time. And then it makes sense to them. And then they sing it and they know why. So, you know, equally, these terms and these songs... The older generation of fans that maybe hear a younger fan using it or see them using it online, what what's to stop them explaining to them why it's wrong? And, you know, I, I, I've written lots of stuff about this and about the, where the line is and what we should be doing. And, you know, that's me trying to do my bit. But I think there are more people who, who, who could do their bit and the, there are people who turn a blind eye. There are maybe people who... who you know, maybe have a little bit of a smirk at it and, and don't get involved. Well, do you get involved? Do you get involved and challenge it? Do you get involved and try and change it? Because you say it's not going away. Well, the rivalry's not going away, no. Because Manchester United and Liverpool will likely always be 
two of the clubs going for the trophies for the rest of our lives. And, and you know, and in a way, long may that continue because I, I, I like there to be a bit of beef, a bit of edge, but it's again, knowing where the line is and surely everyone can say to younger fans, well, you know what? Football disasters is off the table. You know what? Chance about homelessness or dipping bins is off the table because it's ridiculous. It, it's not. It's not based in fact. Anyone who's going to football matches on a regular basis is paying forty and fifty quid a week, so they're not dipping into bins. So it, it's just. It's just daft. And and the idea that you know someone no doubt will come back to me today and say, "Wow, well, it winds you up, doesn't it?" Well, just get away from that. Why does that matter? Why do you want to wind up a stranger on the basis of homelessness? Uh, or, or poverty you know wind me up about the fact that you know we might not retain our title sound wind me up about the fact that you know our owners aren't putting their hands in the pocket to buy a sense of half right now sound wind me up about you know who who brought fashion back to to england first from from europe all those daft arguments that go on between liverpool and man united fans i enjoy all that that that's football culture that's proper football culture but disasters no thanks not for me you know the, this sort of Tragedy tennis that takes up takes place at games between Liverpool and Man United should be dead. Leave it alone. Move on. Like I say, the pandemic's a time when I think we can all be thinking about how we behave in every aspect of our lives. And I'd love to think there's quite a few things about football that various people across the game can go, is that right? And maybe we should leave that now. And maybe next time we do something different, we do something cleverer. You know, all the stuff about... You know, Liverpool fans saying to Man United, come back when you've won 18. And then Man United come, fans coming back with a flag that says, well, you know, we're back or whatever it is and things like that. That's all fine and that's all good and that's clever. And the banners and stuff like that between the two sides, by and large, have been good ones. And I enjoy that kind of stuff. Let's have more of that. Let's have more. Let, let's just be a bit classier around football, surely. Yeah. Well, look, you've articulated that brilliantly, uh, Gareth. We'll link to a couple of your pieces as well. I had a read of them over the last 24 hours. Some really great stuff in the Anfield Wrap. Thanks, Thanks a million, as always. Cheers. Thanks, boys. Gareth Roberts there on the line. A couple of comments coming in as well. Brandon saying, sad that rivals have that tribal mentality after 90 minutes. Time to live your lives. And TMG, or TMAC G saying that Gareth Roberts speaks a lot of sense. Nastiness is often justified just as banter. But there's a line of decency that should be respected by all fans. And uh, so say all of us. It's quarter past eight on this Friday morning. Uh, plenty to uh, come over the course of the show.